Welcome back, nerdlings. In this video, we're going to be talking about cellular communication. Let's get started. So in this lecture, we're going to be describing the ways that cells can communicate with one another, and we're also going to be covering short distance versus long distance cellular communication. So first of all, how does this communication really happen? Well, communication requires the generation, the transmission, the reception of a signal. And eventually, a response will occur as a result of that signal being sent. So in cellular systems, signals are generally chemical molecules such as hormones. But they can also include direct detection of environmental conditions, such as light or bacteria that can sense when their little buddies, other bacteria, are close by. Pathways involved are called signal transduction pathways. And they look something similar to this, much more complicated. But we have a signaling molecule, it binds with the receiving protein, or if it's nonpolar, it can go directly through the plasma membrane, and eventually it can cause the upregulation or downregulation of a gene, meaning the gene is either expressed or it is repressed. So signal transduction is completely universal, whether you are a teeny tiny prokaryotic bacteria or whether you are a super advanced multicellular organism such as a dolphin. So all of those organisms have signal transduction pathways because they all have to communicate that protein-based nature of the signal transduction pathway, along with its adaptive significance, makes that signal transduction a major area of evolution. So in unicellular organisms, pathways allow those organisms to receive information from their environment and then to respond to that environment. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this guy shortly. In multicellular signaling pathways, they allow multicellular organisms such as myself or dolphins or insects or rabbits or fish or birds to receive information and then to coordinate it with all the cells in the organism in responding to that information. And our body is constantly being bombarded with cell signals. That is what allows us to react to our environment, whether that is external, meaning like the air, the temperature, or whether that is internal, such as if I've consumed glucose or some type of fat, and my body now has to signal for different enzymes to come and to break those down or to build or synthesize and put those together. Cellular communication always involves the production, exchange, and receipt of chemical messages. Those chemical messengers, the fancy schmancy sciency word that we use is called a ligand. So those signaling molecules are called ligands. There are a variety of ways in which these signaling molecules, or ligands, can be exchanged between cells. Now, we have cells that can signal themselves. And when I teach this, I always talk about, if we're a cell and we're talking about autocrine signaling, boop, we basically bop or signal ourselves. We're bop, we're self-regulating. Now, we also have cell-to-cell -cell contact. We have a couple of different types of that. We also have paracrine or short distance signaling. And then we have long distance signaling that is our endocrine or hormonal signaling. So as far as cell-to-cell -cell contact goes, we are going to talk about whenever one cell is basically contacting another cell. So it's exactly what it sounds like. One cell will express a ligand or a signaling molecule, and the other expresses a receptor, and they bind together. Now, I like to kind of talk about it similarly to when an enzyme binds with a substrate. So just like an enzyme might bind with a substrate, similarly, if we have a ligand or our signaling molecule, and it binds with the protein that's going to be the receiving protein, it's going to bind with that, cause a slight conformational change, and that will relay the signal until eventually a response occurs. Now, when those two cells come into contact, that receptor and the ligand bind, and again, that signal is transmitted into the recipient cell. 
So this is a very important type of cell communication for immune responses as well as embryological development and stem cells in adults. So another type of cell-to-cell -cell contact is called gap junctions in animals and plasmodesmata in plants. So this is basically just saying that they have these pores. So if you look right here, we have little pores from adjacent cells, meaning that molecules from the cytoplasm of one cell can basically traverse into the next cell. Same thing happens in plant cells. They have to attach, basically, I don't want to say attach, but adjacent cells that are right next to one another, they can form these pores in which those cells can communicate through the pore by sending those signaling molecules back and forth. Now, in animal cells, again, that's called a gap junction, and that's when the plasma membrane has the pores in it. Now, in plant cells, we have cell walls. So we have to have that pore that basically extends from the plasma membrane also through the cell wall in order for those hormones to be sent back and forth or different signaling molecules. So this type of signaling is also extremely important for plants' immune systems. And yes, plants too have immune systems just like we do. So for example, if a plant cell encounters a virus, we could have three different types of responses. That cell might signal in neighboring unaffected cells to destroy the RNA and to reduce protein synthesis. It might signal neighboring cells that are infected to undergo a ptosis. And I say a ptosis because that's referring to cell death or programmed cell death. It could also activate immune cells to come and destroy the pathogen. So another type of cell communication that we refer to as vocal is called paracrine signaling. Now cells secrete ligands or those signaling molecules into the extracellular space. So the surrounding cells within that space have a matching receptor. And if they have that matching receptor, they'll respond to the signal. And this is how cells in certain areas all know to grow at the same time. Like if I scraped my arm, all of my skin cells in that vicinity would know that they need to start reproducing and creating more skin cells. Now, the same thing unfortunately happens whenever we get tumor growth. So this is the same type of signaling that can lead to a tumor. We get one cell where their signaling pathway gets flawed, and instead of checking or stopping growth, all of a sudden it keeps growing, and it keeps producing that same chemical message that tells all of its friends surrounding it to grow as well. And then we get unchecked cell growth, which can eventually develop out into a tumor. So a very specialized type of a local signaling is called synaptic signaling. And this has to deal with neurotransmitters or transmitting signals from one nerve cell called a neuron to the next. Now ligands are produced by cells and they diffuse to the local target cell population. So if we're looking at this guy right here, this would be one neuron. And these little guys are called neurotransmitters. Now they're released from one neuron and they go into this space. And the space between two neurons is called a synapse, hence synaptic signaling. So these little guys right here, the signaling molecules, which are called ligands, are going to go into this space or the synapse between the two nerve cells. They will eventually dock with the receiving protein and that signal will continue to get transmitted. Now, something that a lot of us have probably heard of, and some of us may have even had personal experiences with, are a class of drugs called SSRIs, or serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So it's exactly what it sounds like. Inhibit means to stop or to prevent. So whenever we have an inhibitor, it's actually preventing neurotransmitters from being transmitted from one neuron and then actually being received by the receiving protein on the next. So a lot of medications, not just SSRIs, work with different types of neurotransmitters and preventing different types of messages from being sent. And so it's this huge industry looking at cell signaling and how different molecules affect those cell signaling pathways. And research goes into this with treating different diseases such as cancer. I told you I'd get back to this cute little guy. 
So signaling pathways, again, allow unicellular organisms to receive information from their environment and respond just like multicellular organisms. So a specific type of cell signaling that bacterial cells use is called quorum sensing. And so the example that I've given you here is basically we have a single little bacterial cell. And I'm gonna use an example of bioluminescence or producing light. So whenever a bacteria is by itself, or maybe there's just a few other bacteria around, they're producing these molecules. And when they produce these molecules and there's not many other bacteria to encounter them, nothing really happens. They're just kind of releasing them out into the environment. Now, as this bacterium divides and it starts to increase in population size, that also increases the amount of this molecule that it's, pro that it's producing. And eventually, when it gets to a certain concentration, all of the bacteria around get triggered by this molecule and it causes them to switch on or upregulate the production of a gene that produces light. Hence, they will bioluminesce. Now this little guy right here is a squid that actually has a symbiotic relationship with bioluminescent bacteria. So it houses bioluminescent bacteria within its body and it uses that bioluminescent bacteria to actually camouflage itself from predators whenever it is hunting and looking for its own food at night, especially when there's some light reflection in starry nights it actually regulates the amount of bioluminescence that the bacteria can actually create by having this little shutter on it. So it will basically open this little shutter and the bioluminescent bacteria are glowing because they're in a high concentration. And the darker it is outside, the less of those bioluminescent bacteria the shutter basically exposes. So it's pretty cool. But again, another example of local signaling quorum sensing in bacteria. If there's just one bacteria, not working. But if we have a lot of bacteria together, they can actually sense that there's a larger population and they can all simultaneously upregulate that gene and start to glow. So the last type of cellular communication we're going to discuss is called long distance signaling. This is also referred to as hormonal signaling or endocrine signaling. So as most of you know, the endocrine system produces hormones in different glands, and those hormones travel throughout the circulatory system to their target cells. So one example is the human growth hormone. So it's a protein-based hormone, like human growth hormone, or I should say protein-based hormones, similar to the human growth hormone, have to bind to those service receptor proteins on the plasma membrane to actually trigger a, pause or a signal transduction pathway. So if we have a protein-based hormone, they carry with them a charge. So they can't just go straight through that plasma membrane. They have to dock onto a receiving protein that is on the plasma membrane. That receiving protein will then transmit the message into the cell, which will create a transduction pathway and eventually a cellular response. And again, those protein-based hormones have a charge, so they can't just go through that plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. They have to dock with the receiving protein first, which will then transmit the signal. So those molecules don't actually go into the cell. They're basically that relay message. Now, contrary to that, we have lipid-based hormones or fat-based hormones. Now, because lipids are nonpolar, meaning they do not carry a charge, they can actually go straight into the plasma membrane or straight through the plasma membrane into the cellular space itself. They do not dock with the receiving protein. Those molecules actually go straight into the cell itself. So lipid-based hormones, for example, like sex hormones, those can go directly through that plasma membrane and to the DNA to trigger a specific response or to trigger a specific type of hormone or protein to be produced, meaning that it triggers that, that's going to be expressed in the nucleus. So the DNA is going to start basically telling messenger RNA, hey, I need you to get, get this message out of the cell and I need you to go to this ribosome and start making this protein so we can use it. So 
I hope that was helpful. For more videos like this one, you can visit www.nerdlingscience.com. This is the Queen Nerdling signing off. Have a great day.